you, Gina, for that generous introduction. As I hope most of you in this room already know, Gina is the most talented actress, the fiercest activist, the kindest heart, the most brilliant mind, and she's also a director and a boxer, so just keep watching her. She's the best. Um, Tiffany, Emma, Regina, Lena, I would be humbled just to shake your hands, not to mention share this honor and this stage with you. I admire each of you so, so deeply. Thank you for the work that you do and that you're exposing to us to more today. And to Emma in particular, your courage at your age after such a traumatic moment to have done what you and your peers have done has given me and given all of us hope for the future that one day I can drop my kid off at school without imagining the possibility of the nightmare that you and way too many kids have experienced in this country. So thank you so much personally. So how are you all doing? Are you tired? I am so tired. Oh my God, my son asked me the other day why it looked like I'd been wearing goggles. I was like, I was like, baby, Kavanaugh, Kavanaugh, I don't sleep, I don't sleep, okay. Anyway, it's been a rough couple weeks, but we've also had an incredible week at Time's Up, the organization I'm here to talk about, because this week we welcomed our first president and CEO, Lisa Borders. Lisa, Lisa is coming to us after heading the WNBA, and she is a brilliant, compassionate, strategic leader with vast experience in business, activism, and government, and we are so lucky and so grateful to have her come guide our path. Thank you. So I came to the first Time's Up meeting almost exactly one year ago after uh, the, the shattering reports by Megan Tuohy, Jody Cantor, and Ronan Farrow were published about Harvey Weinstein. I had heard the stories, of course, about Harvey, like we all had, but was horrified to learn the extent of his abuse. However, the part of the story I had never considered before was how many women were forcibly removed from our industry because of his retaliatory behavior. The articles in the New York Times and the New Yorker, as you all know, detailed his active character assassination of the women he assaulted, telling directors that the actresses he had abused were difficult or crazy and not to work with them. Harvey's lawyer, David Boyce, signed contracts with spy firms to surveil the women who reported his crime to try to make them out as whores and track their movements. He did this, as many harassers and assaulters do, to take power away from their victims because if they have less work, they have less money, and then they have less power, and eventually they have less credibility and less reputation, and again, less power to get him in trouble for the crimes he committed. And it's working. Harvey is still free today. And yesterday, the New York County DA, Cy Vance, just dismissed one of the cases against him because um, our legal system and our culture protects the perpetrators of sexual violence, not its victims. Harvey Weinstein, the man whose name has become synonymous with serial rapist, might never suffer any legal consequences because of that. As Jody Cantor noted, Weinstein's abuse was so pervasive that a whole generation of actresses had been pushed out of our industry and had been deprived of decades of work and the payment that accompanies it. But what other women in our industry and in other industries have been silenced and shut out in this way? I had always... I had always wondered why there was still unequal representation in nearly every industry, and particularly in positions of leadership and power, when graduate schools have been consistently enrolling equal amounts of men and women. I wondered, why do women graduate 50-50 from law schools, and yet they make up only 20% of law firm partnerships? Why do women graduate 50-50 from all business schools, and yet make up only 10.6% of the Fortune 500 boards, and 4.8% of Fortune 500 CEOs? Or in our industry, women are graduating 50-50 from film schools, and only 11% of the top 250 films last year were directed by women. So there's this theory that a lot of people say that women drop out of the workforce to focus on motherhood or because the workplace isn't conducive enough to rearing children. And I used to believe that explanation, but it always seemed suspicious. Like, 
a woman spends hundreds of thousands of dollars on law school and all the time and hard work to graduate and all the hours and stress to pass the bar and then works for years at a law firm and then gives up her six or seven figure job that she loves and has invested so much time into because she never considered she might need to find childcare for her kid and a woman who can probably easily afford childcare. It was confusing, but I bought it because, well, I don't know, I'm a sheep. Um, but now I want to dispel that myth. First of all, there are too many women who either don't choose to have children, do not yet have children, or have grown children to account for the gaping lack of women in leadership positions in almost every industry. Second, there are many professions that might be considered incompatible with motherhood that are nearly all female. Like, think about gynecology. Gynecology is one of the most time-consuming, emotionally intensive fields of medicine, and they're on, uh, on call around the clock. My dad's a gynecologist, so I remember like late at night him getting calls and running to the hospital. Today, almost all gynecologists are women, and many of them have kids. So what is this rumor about women not being able to do hard jobs and have kids at the same time? In gynecology, there's a unique demand for females. Women are asking for other women to do the job. So that affects hiring. Also, women are the primary people that the doctors have to deal with, so you have to assume that harassment and assault goes way down. So if there's a lesson to be learned from our vagina doctors, it's that increased demand for women and increased physical and emotional safety on the job, women will flock to that field that is emotionally and intellectually intense and also that is incredibly time consuming. And similarly, in our business, People make the argument that we see so, female, so few female directors and DPs and camera departments and VFX supervisors, wait, like every job, um, because set life isn't conducive to family life. Well, what about the hair and makeup and wardrobe departments? They're like entirely female and they figure out how to work on movies and TV shows and take care of their families if they have chosen to have families. So, it's much more likely for a woman to stay in a job for her children than to leave for her children. Consider all the women in the restaurant industry or domestic workers who sometimes work many jobs at once in order to support their kids. So let's stop saying that women are choosing to drop out of the workforce because of their families. That's wrong. It's wrong. Of course, of course, there are women who have a personal preference for being full-time parents, and that is a beautiful and admirable choice, and way harder than working all the time, in my opinion, and unpaid. Um, but, but not like all the women who should be in the leadership positions who are not there. And sure, sets and offices in every workplace can improve a lot when it comes to helping working parents, both male and female, allowing more family leave, creating spaces at work for daycares or preschools, creating reasonable work hours, post-work expectations so people can live their lives. But gynecologists don't have longer maternity leave or daycare at work, and they're an all female profession now practically. So let's not say that these are the reasons women are leaving the workforce. Let's be clear. The reason women in nearly every industry are not represented in powerful positions is because women are being discriminated against or retaliated against for hiring and for promotion. When they do get the jobs, they are being often being harassed and assaulted and they are being paid less than their male counterparts, all of which coerce self-preserving women into finding safer options for themselves and different ways to feel valued. Many women are further oppressed by intersections with other marginalized identities, whether by sexual orientation, race, age, class, religion, physical ability, and are subject to multiple avenues of discrimination and harassment at work at once. And then if they try and report it, there's often a second harassment, and their reputations are smeared, their future hiring is jeopardized, and they are further harassed. So that is why our first action at Time's Up was to start the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund with the National Women's Law Center. Because women need to put food on the table, and in order to do so, they need to be able to do their work in a safe, equitable, and dignified environment. In its first year, our Time's Up Legal Defense Fund has served more than 3,500 people, from workers at McDonald's, to prison guards, to military personnel, to women in our own industry, who have faced gender-based harassment, discrimination, coercion, and assault. Recently, our lawyers helped Melanie Kohler triumph against Brett Ratner and his lawyer, Marty Singer, 
Pay attention to who you're hiring as your lawyers who tried to use Brett's enormous financial advantage over her to legally bully her into silence. Because of our lawyers, Melanie did not have to retract her claims of assault against him, and he dropped his case of defamation because he saw that she could not be bullied legally just because he has hundreds of millions of dollars and she does not. At Time's Up, we want all people, men, women, and those who identify as neither and both, to lead the charge to make hiring more fair, make wages more equitable, and make the workplace environment safe and dignified for all. We now have Time's Up chapters in tech, in finance, in advertising, in journalism, in medicine, and we have sister organizations among restaurant workers, domestic workers, and farm workers who organize far before we did. We are thousands of women across multiple industries internationally joining together to make the same demands of the world. So what can you do? First, money. You can give or you can raise money for the Legal Defense Fund. Second, gather. Meet with other women and see what changes you want to make. Through Time's Up or On Your Own, gathering has been the central principle of what we do and has created every action we have taken. Third, listen, if any group you're in has people who only look like you, change that group. It's an awakening experience to hear from women who have different experiences of marginalization. Fourth, demand. The women in this room are the most powerful women in our industry. All you in this room have the power to negotiate for equal pay or grant equal pay or popularize equal pay in our culture. Be embarrassed if everyone in your workplace looks like you. Pay attention to physical ability, age, race, sexual orientation, gender identity, and make sure you've got all kinds of experiences represented. Fifth, gossip well. Stop the rhetoric that a woman is crazy or difficult. If a man says to you that a woman is crazy or difficult, ask him, what bad thing did you do to her? That's a code. That's a code word. He is trying to discredit her reputation. Make efforts to hire people who've had their reputations smeared in retaliation. Sixth, don't be shy. Don't shy away from consequences for those who abuse their power. Those who abuse power are not going to have a change of behavior out of the goodness of their hearts. They are motivated by self-interest and they will only change their behavior if they have to worry they will lose what they care about. Seventh, and this is a united challenge to everyone in this room, tell a new story. What if we took a year off from violence against women? What if for one year, everyone in this room, just one year, does everything in their power to make sure that all the entertainment produced from this room doesn't depict a rape or murder of a woman? In the projects you write, produce, direct, act, package, market, do not harm women this year. Let's see how that goes. So I want to leave off with a reminder that our family of animals, mammals, is named after us, women, because of our mammary glands. Yes, the most remarkable thing about our whole type of animal is our boobs. We know that. Men know that, and babies definitely know that. In fact, at, at our first Time's Up meeting, I was breastfeeding my daughter during the meeting in a room that not only allowed it, but welcomed it and applauded it. But anyway, our boobs are amazing. And there's a message in our mammary glands. Many men are behaving like we live in a zero-sum game, that if women get the respect, access, and value they deserve, that men will lose theirs. But we know the message of the mammaries. The more milk you give, the more milk you make. The more love you give, the more love you have. And the same can be said of fire. When you light someone else's torch with your own, you don't lose your fire. You just make more light and more heat. So my last challenge to everyone in this room is to spread your fire. Use your fire to light other women's torches and make more light and more heat for all of us. If every powerful woman in this room pledges to hire three women in jobs this year that women don't usually get, directors, cinematographers, VFX supervisors, composers, stunt coordinators, board members, I mean like all the jobs are jobs that women don't usually get. <laughs> Just 
Pick three jobs that you get to choose and light a woman's torch. That light will multiply and the heat will intensify for all of us. Do you all pledge with me? Yeah. Love you.